Air comes in at one atmosphere and 35 degrees C. It's compressed in a staged reciprocating compressor with intercooling to a final pressure of 50 atmospheres. For each stage, the inlet gas temperature is 35 degrees C and the maximum allowable outlet temperature is 200 degrees C. Mechanical power is the same for all stages and the isentropic efficiency is 65% for each stage. The volumetric flow rate of air is 0.5 cubic meters per second at the inlet to the first stage. Then we're asked how many stages are gonna be required to do this? What is the mechanical power requirement per stage? What is the heat duty of the intercooler? And we're told that water is the coolant for the intercoolers. If it enters at 25 degrees C and leaves at 45 degrees C, what is the cooling water rate per intercooler? And we are told to assume that air is an ideal gas. And it's obviously a simple ideal gas because the constant pressure heat capacity is constant and equal to seven halves R. When I started this problem, I wanted to take a step back, draw the picture of the process, then try to figure out what to calculate and dive back in. And my thought process started at the very first stage. So here, I'll just draw a simple box. We'll call this stage one. And we know entering the very first stage that we have air at 35 degrees C, and we know that the pressure is equal to one atmosphere. And then leaving stage one, we know we're gonna enter this intercooler. And one of the things that I immediately did here was to label that I really don't know the temperature that's leaving, and I really don't know the pressure that's leaving the first stage. Then through this interstage cooler, I know that I'm gonna have liquid water at 25 degrees C entering, and I know that I'm gonna have liquid water that's leaving at 45 degrees C, but I also don't know what the mass flow rate is. That's one of the things that we are tasked with finding. The other thing that I know about stage one is that to do a compression, I'm going to have to do work. And I also don't know what that is. Okay. So in my assessment, this is sort of the first steps of what happens, right? And then you leave the cooler at the same temperature that you started and you go back into stage two or, or you go into the next stage, which I just labeled as stage two. And again, I know that I have air at 35 degrees C and you don't know what the pressure is, right? Um, from stage one to stage two. And then we're going to go back through another cooler. And it's the same conditions of water. And we also don't know what the flow rate is. And we know that we're going to do some amount of work in stage two that's equal to the amount of work that's in stage one. And I never tried to guess what the pressure would be at any one of these stages. So the way that I drew this is I said, okay, well, then we're gonna do this a lot of times until finally we reach the thing that I just called stage N. And we're gonna have some amount of work that we're done that is done in stage N. And we know that leaving stage N, we're going to have a pressure of 50 atmospheres, and we don't know what the final temperature is. Oh, sorry, it's not letting me right near the bottom of my screen. Okay. But one of the things that we probably know is that since every stage previous has been exactly the same, 
those temperatures are going to be the same. Okay. And so that's my diagram for, um, for this particular process. Now, um, we said when we solved problems related to compressors that we would always do one specific thing. And what was that? Isentropic case. Okay. So if we're going to do this, then for each stage, we're going to try to understand what's happening right during isentropic operation. And for us, you know, that equation that to describe how the entropy is changing as a function of temperature and pressure was that delta S over R equals the integral from T1 to T2 of CP over R dt over t minus the natural log of p2 uh, over p1. And in this particular expression, right, we know that that's zero for the isentropic case. We also know that cp over r is just equal to seven halves because we were told that the constant pressure heat capacity is equal to seven halves r. And we've done this integral before. And we know then that seven halves times the natural log of T2 over T1 just equals P2 over P1. And we've also rearranged this before to show that T2 over T1, here, let me do this, T2 over T1 to the seven halves equals P2 over P1. And now in the past, we've even simplified this further, um, but I won't necessarily do that here, okay? And what do we know that is in this equation right now? The initial and final pressures. So, is that true? Well, for the whole, for the whole um, process, we do. So, I don't know if you would look at, we, we kind of did something in 300 where it was like you looked at the whole thing first and then, uh, then like use what you learned from the entire process to look at the inner workings of it. I don't know if you would approach it that way or... Well, one of the problems with doing this here is that if you think about this, T1 is obviously going to be this, um, this temperature here, right? It's going to be uh, 35 degrees C. But T2 is that temperature. And if, if you did the total pressure change in the entire compressor without the intercooling, you actually would end up to the same place. You could use this equation and then you would find the final T2 that's coming out of here. But the fact that we have intercooling at each one of these stages means that you actually have to consider what is happening in each one of these stages individually because you're going to heat it up to some temperature then cool it back down then heat it up to that temperature again and then cool it back down and then heat it up to that temperature again and cool it down etc. So in this equation, we really do have to focus on stage one specifically. And if we're going to do that, let me bring up our problem statement a little bit. So it's, it's here next to us. So if we're looking at solving this equation, you know, this one that I'm circling, so how many unknowns do we have in that equation? Two. And you would think that those are T2 and P2. Yeah. And, but the problem gives us a little bit more information that we can use to tell us what T2 might be. The maximum outlet. Is it the maximum? Exactly. But 
here's a slightly different way to look at this. So we're looking at solving the isentropic case. We're told the maximum outlet temperature is 200 degrees, and we know the efficiency is 65%. So if we actually solve the isentropic case with a temperature equal to 200 degrees C, what would the real temperature be? It would be greater than that. And so we would actually break that rule, right? We're told the maximum allowable outlet temperature, and that's the real outlet temperature, is 200 degrees C. And so we're kind of stuck where even though we are going to have to do something with the isentropic case, there are, are presently two unknowns and one equation. So we actually can't look at this in exactly the same way that we've looked at it previously. And had this been a homework problem, this probably would have been the biggest confusion because it would be natural to say, oh, well, T2 for the isentropic case is just this maximum temperature, but it can't be. Okay, so let's then try to figure out how we're gonna use the information that we have to solve for um, the isentropic temperature because we are definitely going to need it, right? This is the thing that's going to give us the ratio of the pressures between each of the stages. Now, the place that I like to look is that we know that the work that's gonna be done in each of the stages is just equal to the change in the enthalpy in those stages. And we know, of course, that the heat capacity here is equal to a constant, right? So it's just Cp delta T, which equals seven halves R times the change in the temperature. And we know then at each stage that the maximum real temperature is gonna be equal to 200 degrees C. So let's use this and let's also use the fact that we know that the efficiency is equal to delta H for the isentropic case over delta H real, okay? And just rearrange this equation a little bit. And what we're really trying to do at the end of the day here is to get the ratio of the pressures. But we're, believe it or not, gonna use this as our second equation. So that way we'll have two equations and we'll have two unknowns. So if I move delta H real over to the left-hand side of this, right? So we have that the efficiency times delta H real is equal to delta H when delta S is equal to zero. Well, we know then this is just the efficiency times the heat capacity, right? times T2 max minus T1, and that's going to equal the heat capacity times T2 when delta S equals zero minus our initial temperature. And of course, the heat capacities are constant here, so those two things cancel. And we get that the efficiency times T2 maximum minus T1 just equals T2 when delta S is equal to zero minus T1. Or this thing that we're after, right? The, the, the temperature for the isentropic case just equals T1 plus the efficiency times T2 max minus T1. And we know the values for all of these. So T1 is 35 degrees C or 308.15 Kelvin plus 0 0.65 times T2 max, which is 200 degrees C, which is 473.15 Kelvin minus T1, which is 308.15 Kelvin. And so from there, we can find that the isentropic temperature for this process is 
415.4 Kelvin. Okay. And the reason that that's important is because we know that this is true for every stage, right? Because we're gonna do intercooling and the amount of work that's gonna be done is the same and the efficiency is the same. So for every single stage, T2 for the isentropic case equals 415.4 Kelvin. And that brings us to the relationship that we had above just, um, just a minute ago that we had that the natural log, and I'm going back to the natural log on purpose so we can use a rule of logs to our advantage, where T2 for the isentropic case over T1 equaled the natural log of P2 over P1. Now, if we think about this, the thing that's going to be the same for every single stage is that ratio, right? That is going to be the same no matter what we do. And for n stages, right, we're just interested in that ratio for every single stage. So if we actually think about this or write this, right, you also could write then, so this is stage one, right? So uh, that's stage insane. Yeah. Would it have to be seven halves times the natural log of oh, the yeah. difference in yeah. temperatures? There we go, right? Uh, where are you looking? That was the place. Sorry. Okay. I myself yeah. Yeah. No, 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 but thank you. That, um, thank you for the seven halves. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. Good catch. So if we look at this, right, and we have the natural log of T2 delta S equal to zero over T1 equals the natural log of P2 over P1. So now if we did this, let's say for stage two, so we'd still get the natural log of T2 delta S equals zero over T1 to the seven halves. Now that equals the natural log of P3 over P2, right? Stage two. And we can do this over and over and over again. And now what you could do is if we were to come up with an expression, right, relating P3 and P1, you would basically get there by multiplying these things together. And what you would get, right, let's just say, let's forget N, but let's just do this for these two stages. Well, what you would get if it were two stages is that now you could find that the natural log of T2 when delta S equals zero over T1 to the seven halves, then for seven halves times two, equaled the natural log of P3 divided by P1. And you really just get that by multiplying these two terms together and those two terms together. Now, that's just going for two stages. If I went three stages, what would change is that this would be times three, right? And that would be P4. And I can do this over and over and over again for as many stages as I could possibly want. And if I did that, that just becomes seven halves times N, and that's just P final over P1. And if that's not clear, then you know, we, can, we can do this, I guess, at the end of class if you want to, but it's just us multiplying these terms together and using a couple of rules for logs. So we get this natural log of T2 delta S equals zero over T1 to the seven halves N equals the natural log of P final over P initial. So now I'm gonna use one more rule of logs and just say, okay, that's just seven halves 
n times the natural log of t2 when delta s equals 0 over t1 equals the natural log of p final over p1. And what's the only unknown in this problem? P final. And yeah, it's just n, right? Because we know p final. It should be um, it should be fifty atmospheres from the problem statement. And so that means that n equals two sevenths times the natural log of 50 atmospheres over one atmosphere divided by the natural log of our, um, our isentropic temperature, which was 415.4 Kelvin, divided by the initial temperature, which was 308.15 Kelvin. And so that actually equals 3.74. So how many stages are there? Four. There's four stages. That's correct, right? So we can't have 3.74 3. stages. So n equals four. And now what that means is actually that the values that we calculated above aren't exactly right. And in particular, this isentropic temperature. Right, the way that we did this is we went all the way to the maximum possible temp like real temperature. And then we backed off, um, or we went all the way to the maximum real temperature, then found the isentropic temperature for that case, and then found N. But the actual N is four. And so all we need to do to figure out the real or not the real isentropic temperature, that's sort of mixing verbiage a little bit. But to find the isentropic temperature with four stages is just to reapply this equation that we derived, but now with n equal to four. So we know that seven halves times four, and here I'll draw this down here, times the natural log of T2 delta S equals zero over T1, which is 308.15 Kelvin equals the natural log of 50 divided by one. And so T2, when delta S equals zero is, sorry, I drew the delta S equal to zero a little bit big, actually equals 407.5 K. And so for multi-stage compression, and this is why we're doing this together in class, finding the isentropic temperature is a lot more involved than that one thing. Because when we know we have four stages, you have to solve it in such a way that there are four even stages. And this is how we get there. And so there's our isentropic temperature. Now for every other problem that we've solved so far, the next step was to use the isentropic temperature to find the work, right? Or to find delta H. So we can do that. So we know that delta H real is equal to delta H when delta S equals zero divided by the efficiency. And so of course, delta H when delta S equal to zero is just seven halves times R 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times delta T for the isentropic case. And we just calculated that that's 407.5 Kelvin minus 308.15 Kelvin divided by 0 0.65. Now if we do that, we find that delta H real equals 4447 joules per mole. Right, and that's good. All right, so we're gonna use this. We haven't actually answered the question yet. But we're gonna use that. Um, we can find the real exit temperature as well, right? Because delta H real equals seven halves R, 
times T2 real minus T1. And so that actually gives us the, the actual maximum temperature is 461 Kelvin, which is equal to 188 degrees C. You're not asked for that, but it's right around 200 degrees. So just making sure that we didn't break any rules. All right. So we know the isentropic temperature. We know delta H real, which means we know the work um, in joules per mole. So if you look at the problem on the right-hand side, we've answered question A, which was four, but we haven't actually answered B yet. What is the work requirement per stage? Because remember, the work is equal to you know, M dot delta H. And what we're going to do to find M dot is we're going to use the ideal gas law, right? So PV is equal to NRT, right? And N then equals just PV over RT. And entering the system, we know we're at one atmosphere. We know that the volumetric flow rate is 0 0.5 cubic meters per second, which is 500 liters per second, divided by R, which in these units is 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin times the initial temperature, right? 308.15 Kelvin. And so the, the flow rate then is equal to 19.77 moles per second. So our work then is equal to 19.77 moles per second times 4,447 joules per mole. And this should give us joules per second, right? Which is 87,900 joules per second, which is 97, or sorry, 87,900 watts or 87.9 kilowatts. All right, so there's part B for this problem where we've been able to then calculate the mechanical power that was needed um, for each stage. I think I heard somebody unmute. Does somebody have a question? No? Okay, sorry, I just heard a little bit of rustling. Okay, um, the next question is what is the heat duty of the intercooler? Now this is kind of an interesting question because if we go back up to our diagram, right? If you, if you look at this, that the initial state entering- hey, Dr. Mustang? Yeah. I think there was a question in the chat. Someone was wanting to know where T2 real came from. Okay, uh, so I have said this a few times before. I can't see the chat while I do this. So, um, you know, please feel free to interject and, and ask a question. Um, where does T2 real come from? So, once we actually calculate the real enthalpy, right? So, we were able to actually find delta H for each individual stage. And we know that that is just equal to delta S equal to zero over the efficiency. So I could have actually found this number and then just done delta H is equal to CP times T2 real minus T1, right? And that's just this equation here. So I first calculated the value for delta H real, and then I used it to find the real T2. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Oh, no, no problem. So if we look up here, where the initial state of the gas or the initial enthalpy of our ideal gas is actually the same here as it is here. 
right? All right, our system is this gas moving through these stages, right? So the temperature is the same at those two places. And that means since it's an ideal gas, that its enthalpy is the same, its internal energy is the same. And if that's true, well, our energy balance on this part of the process should just give us that the work is equal to minus Q because there's still no change in kinetic energy. There's no change in the potential energy. There's no uh, change in the internal energy or enthalpy of the fluid. So if we draw a box around a slightly different part of the process where the enthalpy is a state function, then any work that we do here has to be removed as heat there in the cooler. And so because of that, actually, each of the intercoolers, we know that that equation is true, that Q just equals minus W, right, if that's part C of the problem, which is minus 87.9 kilowatts. And the total heat that you have to remove, so we'll call this Q total, is equal to three times Q for one stage. And why is it three? Because we're only cooling three times. Yeah, you have four stages and you don't care what the final temperature was. And so all you needed to do was to get it to 50 bar. So the intercooler doesn't happen after stage N. So if we have four stages, that would only give us one, two, three coolers. So it's three times that number, which is minus 263.7 kilowatts of cooling that needs to be done. And now we're only looking at the cooling water, and which is at any of these intercoolers. So let me draw a box around the cooler, which of course is just the water in the cooler. And the energy balance there, right? There's no work that's done. There's no change in the kinetic energy. There's no change in the potential energy. This is also gonna operate at steady state. And so if we look at our energy balance and now we think about this from the water's perspective, right? You'd still have D and U dt equals q plus w plus the enthalpy that's entering from mass flow minus the enthalpy that's leaving from mass flow plus the change of kinetic energy plus the change in the potential energy. And we already said those we can neglect. We're operating at steady state. We're not doing any work. So the result here is that zero equals q minus m dot delta H, or M water just equals Q over the change in the enthalpy of the water. And to find that, um, we're going to use the saturated steam tables. And from those tables, we know that liquid water at, um, at 45 degrees C, that the enthalpy is equal to 188.4 kilojoules per kilogram. And our entering condition, which is 25 degrees C, it is 104.8 kilojoules per kilogram. And so delta H then just equals our final state minus the initial state, right? 188.4 minus 104.8 kilojoules per kilogram. And so the change in the enthalpy of the water is 83.6 kilojoules per kilogram. So our total mass flow is then equal to minus 263.7 kilowatts divided by 83.6 um, 
kilojoules per kilogram. And that gives us 3.15 kilograms per second. All right, and the rate per intercooler, of course, is just one third of this number, right? So per intercooler equals 1.05 kilograms per second.